Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Luxury Reality. Today we're talking all about the Tudor Black Bay Chrono. The Tudor Black Bay Chronograph, or as it's known internally, the Tudor Reference M73950-0004. So clearly Rolex hasn't taken any, uh, any lessons from Omega in terms of making references that are a little bit more understandable. Now, I'd like to start out with a little bit of history about Tudor as a brand itself. Now, depending on who you ask, Tudor was founded anywhere between 1926, which is when the name was originally registered, right up until 1946, which is when the company as it currently exists, Montreal Tudor SA, uh, was founded. But the key thing to take away from that is that it was founded by Hans Wilsdorf, who was the founder of Rolex. And he founded Tudor with the vision that he could produce a watch that was of the same quality and utility as his Rolex watches, but at a more affordable, more accessible price point. And that, for majority of Tudor's history, has been the case. Right up to the point where, for the majority of its existence, Tudor's were literally Rolexes with the same case, the same parts and everything, except for the movement. That was always outsourced, and that's how they managed to make it more accessible. Now, that worked for a long time, and Tudor did have a very rich history, and I'll hopefully make another video about specifically Tudor's history. But what I'd like to highlight is that right up until sort of the early to mid 2000s, Tudor was the Porsche Cayman of Rolex. And then it just went dormant. In a lot of markets, they actually pulled out because of poor sales. And a lot of that was down to a lack of identity for the brand. But that all changed in 2012 with the introduction of the Black Bay. Now the Black Bay took inspiration from the 1955 Tudor Oyster Submariner, which was the reference 7923, Obviously, that was a uh, that was a rebadged Rolex Submariner of the time, but the Black Bay also brought that design into the modern age. And the important thing was that it didn't have a direct correspondent Rolex at the time, and it still doesn't. It looks completely different from the current Submariner, and that really brought around a renaissance for Tudor. And they continued riding the Black Bay wave right up until this day. Now, in 2017, they launched this, the Tudor Black Bay Chronograph. Not counting dates, this was the first complication Black Bay, and it started to bring about more diversity in the line was then followed in 2018 with the GMT. With the Black Bay, they did start making their own movements as well, which was a big shift. They introduced the Tudor MT5613, and that was key because that helped create this because while this isn't an in-house movement, it was sourced from Breitling, that Tudor in-house movement was part of an exchange with Breitling for them to provide the B01 movement, which is what's inside this watch. Now that's enough history about this watch. Let's take a look at the watch itself and see what really makes it tick. Really makes it tick, wow. Give me, give me some time with these puns. All right, but starting with the basics, we've got a 41 millimeter case, 22 millimeters at the lugs and 14.5 millimeters thick. So uh, 2018 Tudor brought us back the Pepsi, but in 2017 with this one, they brought back the Fat Lady. So it does wear very tall, but also it has fantastic wrist presence. It really does stand out. Now you'll also notice it does have a bit of a super case presence to it, but in fact, that's down to the fact it's got those 22 millimeter lugs as opposed to the 20s that are normally on the Rolex. So the lugs are still nice and thin and sleek. You've still got that nice straight line along the shoulder, but you have the super case presence. Now inside this 200 meter water resistant case, we have the Breitling B01 movement, or in this case doing service as the Tudor MT5813. But call it what you like, this is the Breitling B01, albeit with a few changes. So this is actually pretty fitting for Tudor because they are continuing to outsource. However, they've definitely upped their game. 
And the advantage is, of course, that Breitling has had this in service since 2009 when they launched it in the Chronomat. So in 2017, when Tudor gets a hold of it and launches this, it's already had eight years of service life behind it to make sure that it is a solid movement. That being said, Tudor, Rolex, they don't take a movement without making a few changes. So they switch the layout. You've got a 45 minute counter on the right and you've got your small seconds on the left. So two register layout with a date. They switched out and put a silicon balance spring on the inside. And in true Rolex fashion, they took the time to decorate the movement as well. And it's front of a plain case back. But if we unscrew the pushers, we find the real beauty of this movement, which is the vertical clutch column wheel chronograph. Now, a vertical clutch system allows you to leave the chronograph running all day if you want to. And also it gives you that instantaneous action on the push. But the reason why that actually works is never really explained in most videos. So I'm going to try to. It works like a car transmission. The clutch actually moves upwards through the movement as opposed to moving inwards or horizontally or laterally like with most chronographs. So what that means is you don't have interlocking teeth. You actually have a clutch that will engage with the other gears much like in a car. Think of it kind of like if you've ever tried shifting a manual transmission without using the clutch, you're gonna damage your gears and also you're gonna feel that judder. That up and down motion obviously does make it a little bit thicker, but it is what gives you that nice smooth start stop and also what lets you run it all day without having to worry too much about wear. It still has that quintessential Black Bay DNA, so you can see that 50s heritage styling to it, but it is still very much a 21st century watch. We have all brush surfaces on the front and then all along the side, we have high polish on that stainless steel case and bracelet. So plenty of room for you to attract fingerprints to use your microfiber on. And once you're done admiring the mirror that it's got on the side, you remember this is a dive watch. So this still has, despite being a chronograph, 200 meter water resistance. And we've got that written in red there as a little bit of a nod to the Submariners of a few decades ago. And that 200 meter water resistance actually beats out its bigger brother Rolex, the Daytona, which only has 100 meters of water resistance. Moving on to the sides, we've got the traditional Tudor Rose logo there on the screw down crown. And we have the two screwed on pushes as well to help with that water resistance. And we move on to the dial. It's got that nice vintage two register look. Originally, I didn't actually like having no hour counter, but the more I think of it, really, when you're timing something in hours, you can just use the normal hands. And speaking of the hands, we have the snowflake hands. These are a tradition of the Black Bay. They are, of course, covered in Superluminova. You can see that a little bit there. Now let's move on to the three things that I like about this watch. The first thing I like is the way it looks. I would describe it as if a 50 Fathoms had a one night stand with a Daytona. And the love child of that is something that's got that 50s flair to it, but it's still very much a 21st century watch. And then you compare it to others in the Black Bay range, you can tell they're brothers, but this one maybe had a different father. And that's what I like about it. It stands out within its own range. And then you compare it to the Daytona, which is the obvious comparison. And at best, they're cousins. And you can tell that Tudor went to great efforts to give it its own identity so it wouldn't be confused for anything else. You know, little details like the rivets on the bracelet. It's got that nice bigger crown with the Tudor rose on it. And even you look at other little details like, you know, it's got the Tudor shield motif everywhere in there on the, on the clasp. When you close the clasp, you see it again. So you can tell they've gone to these lengths to give it its own personality and look. And I love that about this watch. It's, it's so unique. Now, moving on to the second thing that I like about it is the value. Compare this to a Breitling that has the same thing on the inside, same movement and everything, and you're saving two and a half grand. And then you have the inevitable comparison to the Daytona. With this, you have a date, you have 200 meters water resistance, and still a very solid package. And that's exactly what Hans Wilsdorf envisioned. He wanted something that was affordable, but still a great product. Now moving on to the last thing I like about it, it's the clasp. It's got such a solid action to it when you open and close it. It's got these little ceramics here to reduce the wear on the mechanism, so it'll always maintain that solid feeling. It's got nice skeletonization here. You've got the Tudor crown showing up again there. Simple engraving, telling you exactly what you've got, but it still feels so premium. Now you don't get a dive extension, a glide lock, or an easy link. Instead, you get traditional little micro adjustment holes, which you need a very cheap tool to, uh, to manage. 
but that's perfectly fine. On my Omega, I lamented that I didn't just have something as simple as this, but I did have an enormous dive extension. So that's another thing about the clasp that I like, the little micro adjustments so I can make that perfect fit. Now moving on to the three dislikes, the first one is it's way too tall. I normally think of chronographs as actually being quite sophisticated, so it would be great to be able to wear this in a formal capacity on a leather strap. It looks sick, but it doesn't fit under a shirt cuff. And because it's so top heavy, it actually starts to poke out of your jacket sleeve as well. And then that top heaviness is even more apparent when you put it on the factory NATO. Same thing like with leather. It looks great, but because it's so top heavy, it ends up just moving around so much. Now, obviously, that top heaviness is down to the movement being in there, the dome sapphire, which looks really cool as well, but still. And then when you put it on a normal NATO, it does improve and it is a little bit more stable. But the reality is, is that because of its top heaviness and its height, you are limited in the versatility you have with it and you have to stick with the bracelet. Now, the second thing I don't like about this is the screw down pushes. So I could use another chronograph to time how long it takes to unscrew it, push it in, screw it back in again because you don't want to compromise the water resistance, and then you have to screw it out again to stop it. Now, that's losing maybe three seconds each time. So that kind of defies the purpose. And then it's the same sort of story when you want to reset it. Unscrew it, reset it, screw it back in again. Now, don't get me wrong. They look really cool, but, you know, Omega has been making screw-in look pushers on the previous gen Seamaster, and it has 300 meters of water resistance, and you can just push them in. So if Omega can do it, please someone tell me why Rolex or Tudor can't do it. And now, speaking of Rolex, that brings me to my final point that I don't like about it. Of all the things they had to let Tudor inherit... They, of course, had to let them inherit the plain case back. Tudor goes to all this trouble to make this cool-looking movement based off of the B01. It's got a really nice skeletonized rotor, which I would love to see, but you can't see it. So that's the Tudor Black Bay chronograph. It's definitely a watch that every time I take it off, I fall in love with it again. Or, you know, I will put it on a leather strap or a NATO strap, despite its height, because it still looks really cool. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about my experience buying it, because as this was my second luxury piece, I did learn a few lessons from my Omega, but also because I'm still early in my collection, there were still a few more lessons to learn. Now, the first one that I didn't expect was that the negotiation would be a little bit tougher, and that was down to two reasons. The first one was that despite the fact that Tudor isn't fully recognized as being part of Rolex, there is still that association. And when you buy, that's very apparent because as Rolex moves further up market and more premium, that space is starting to be occupied by Tudor. It's doing the same thing that Rolex was doing throughout the majority of, his, of its history before prices started shooting up in offering a really high quality, great value watch for a relatively accessible price point. I mean, we are still talking luxury here, but not definitely not the pricing that Rolex has now, for example. So I didn't expect that it would actually carry some of that association on in terms of the negotiation and them not being as flexible to give you a discount. Now, the next thing that I didn't consider, and I think this is really what killed my negotiation a little bit, was that it doesn't have any natural competitors. It offers such good value. I mean, you compare it to, for example, the Breitling Navitimer 8, which is the cheapest Breitling that uses this same movement. That retails for about 7,000 US dollars. This at full price retail is about 4,400 to 4,500 US dollars, give or take. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get the exact pricing because Tudor doesn't publish their prices on their website, unlike Rolex or Omega, for example. But if you use those numbers, you're talking a two and a half thousand dollar price difference. So it's really hard to negotiate and say, oh, you've got to give me a better price when you're already getting such great value. That being said, of course, I still did negotiate, and I ended up picking this up for the equivalent of 3,650 US dollars. Now, sorry if it takes me a bit to come up with these numbers, but that's because I bought this in Australian dollars and then had to do the exchange. But definitely the lack of competition was something I wasn't prepared for, 
and the fact that the brand is, from a purchasing standpoint at least, it's moved up compared to what it would have been maybe pre-Black Bay. Now, the other thing I wanted to discuss in having this is that it's amazing having it because when people see it, it's so different. While Tudor has moved up in the world, it's still something rare. People don't recognize it like they would recognize it a Samariner or even an Omega for that example, for that matter. So you still get to explain it. But the downside of that is you still fall into, you have to, it's like saying that it's Rolex's little brother. Now, while that doesn't bother me that much, it is still annoying having that stigma. I imagine that people who have Rolexes get, get tired of explaining that it's not a fake. It's a similar sort of thing. With Tudor, inevitably, until it really, really cements its own name in the mainstream, it's going to, you're going to have that Rolex issue, essentially. But that being said, I'm still super happy with it. And it's definitely done what Hans Wilsdorf set out to do. It's a great value chronograph for a reasonable amount of money. And I'm really looking forward to owning this, doing a follow-up review when I hit the one-year mark. Now, if you like this video and you like the content that I'm putting out, please do subscribe to the channel as it does help and it does motivate me to keep putting out more content. If you have a Black Bay of any kind or if you're planning on getting one, drop a comment in the comment section below. I'd love to see what you think about the Black Bay Chrono or any of its brethren in the Black Bay line. And I'm looking forward to making a video hopefully around the one year mark to show what my experience owning this has been. But in the meantime, thank you again for watching another episode of Luxury Reality.